o tom pochybuju. Proč? Vždyť život může mít různý podoby. Ale na Venuši vždyť i sondy tam přežili jen pár minut. Ale to je na povrchu. To tam život lítá v oblacích? No, možná. Buďme si doktora Petkovského z MIT a pak si udělej vlastný názor. So welcome everybody to the uh, meeting of the Czech Mars Society. We have a pleasure of uh, hosting Dr. Janusz Pet Petkovsky, who is a research affiliate at MIT. He is also uh, deputy PI of Venus Life Finder Mission Concept Study. Furthermore, founding member of the Polish Astrobi Astrobiological Society, and uh, maybe for this talk, most importantly, one of the co-authors of the landmark papers about finding phosphine on, in the Venus atmosphere from 2020. And I think Dr. Petkovsky will tell us all about this in his talk about private space missions and life in Venus. So thank you and please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to, to be here uh, online, well, in, in virtually, but but um, and nevertheless, I mean, I, I, I'm really glad that we, I can share share with all of you our our research and our also plans that that uh, might sound uh, very bold or maybe even borderline science fiction to some of you. But I hope that uh, at the end of this talk, I will actually be able to convince you that there is uh, something really, really weird going on in the clouds of Venus and that we really, really have to go there and have a dedicated series of space missions uh, uh, dedicated to the astrobiology of this planet, because the, what we are, uh, what we really are uh, uh, now uh, very strongly or very intensively studying is we are studying the, the conditions on, the, on Venus and, and actually discovering some things that are truly mind boggling, which I hope to tease you uh, or at least in some part share today. So, but before we actually dive into the, into the clouds of Venus, um, we have to remind ourselves what is the main object of interest uh, that we study and this is the planet venus that is often called a sister planet to earth and this is obviously extremely misleading comparison because the only thing that is actually similar between the two planets is maybe the overall size so the mass and radio radius but but the conditions on the on the pla on, on both planets couldn't be couldn't be more different the, uh, for example the surface temperature of on venus is 465 degrees uh, Roughly, and it's it, what this this temperature, this high temperature, makes it the hottest planet in the in the solar system. We also have a approximately 90 times larger uh, surface uh, surface pressure, atmospheric pressure on the on the on the on the surface of, of Venus um, than on Earth. The atmosphere of Venus is also very different than what we have here on Earth. Obviously, the constant the composition of the the gases composition of the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide and molecular nitrogen and two. And of course, on, on Earth, we have an atmosphere dominated by molecular nitrogen and two and, uh, and oxygen um, on, and two as well. But what actually makes Venus such an, such an interesting wor world and what, what makes it stand out is this uh, temperate uh, cloud cover. And this is essentially the, these are the, this is the cloud cover that is permanent and continuous. So it's not like here on Earth, when you have clouds that can form within, let's say, half an hour and then disappear within half an hour. On Venus, essentially, the clouds are permanent and continuous. And, the, and they are called temperate because they are actually at the altitudes of approximately 48 to 60 kilometers above the surface, where the actual temperature conditions, their temperature and pressure conditions, are not as extreme as on the surface of the planet. So at the bottom of the clouds, we have approximately 100, let's say 100 to 80 degrees uh, Celsius. And at the top of the clouds, we have, let's say, from zero to minus 20 Celsius degrees. So this is the temperature range, which actually is pretty conducive to, to in, in principle, of course, theoretically conducive to all kinds of uh, uh, various uh, complex organic chemistry, or maybe even, maybe even life. But of course, the devil is always in the details and the actual chemical 
environment that we have in the clouds of Venus is, of course, very different than what we have here on Earth, because the clouds of Venus are actually made from liquid droplets of concentrated sulfuric acid. So it is not like here on Earth when we have when our clouds are made are mostly made from from liquid droplets of uh, of water. There, the, the dominant liquid on Venus is actually concentrated sulfuric acid, and there is very very little water available. But nevertheless, the concept of life on Venus is something that is not new. It's 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 an idea that actually resurfaces in the scientific literature for uh, for quite a while, and it's literally decades old. Um, I believe uh, Carl Sagan was actually one of the earliest uh, scientists who actually were scientifically uh, postulating this this possibility. And this uh, idea of life on Venus is partially motivated by the by the possibility that Venus actually was a canonically habitable world in the past, or at least it could be in principle. Uh, some scientists believe that the Venus could have the liquid water um, on the surface in the form of oceans, rivers, seas, uh, for as um, until as recently as 700 million years ago. And of course, we don't know if this is the case. There is, this, is, this is actually a highly contentious topic. Some scientists think that Venus always looked like it looks right now as it's this hellish place as it is uh, as, as we see it um, right now. Other scientists uh, believe that it actually could have this period of habit of canonical classical habitability with which is liquid sulfurs water for a variable time from relatively short um, short time uh, to this uh, time to this uh, uh, time frames of even maybe um, one or so billion or maybe even more than that billions of years. Now we of course do not know the, do not know how Venus looked like uh, many many billion billions of years ago, but we have some evidence that indeed maybe from for example Venera Venera landers uh, that maybe some of the uh, rock formations on Venus actually um, could be formed only in the presence of liquid liquid water. This is of course still um, not not entirely proven, but hopefully other missions like for example from NASA. Da Vinci are, um, and um, and other uh, ESA missions as well and Vision and uh, are going to shed more light on this problem. So what we can do, uh, but for, for now we can actually also potentially some people can uh, or we can essentially also speculate or put forward the hypothesis that what if actually Venus had these habitable conditions on the surface and then it actually then when as the conditions deteriorated and life I, I like that as the condition deteriorated life actually could escape. To the only place that it actually could survive potentially, so to the to the clouds um, above the surface, and where it where it potentially could persist today, we have to of course realize that the environmental, if life exists in the clouds of Venus, then the environmental challenges for life in the Venusian clouds are actually absolutely unique and completely different from what we have here on Earth. And this, of course, stems from two uh, two challenges that our life, um, two challenges. First, the concentrated sulfuric acid environment. We already mentioned that, but we have to realize that this is many, many times more, more, many, many times more acidic environment than even the most acidic places that are inhabited on Earth. So, for example, here we have a very pretty picture of uh, of the so-called Dalol pools in the northern Afar in, in in Ethiopia, that that have these very acidic uh, acidic pools of um, pools that are still inhabited by our own extremophiles, this is nothing in comparison to the acidities that we that are present in the clouds of Venus. It's this still looks like an alien planet, and it's still Earth that is inhabited by Earth-like environment, uh, Earth-like microbes, and this has nothing to do, or in terms of acidity, with what we actually can, uh, what we actually expect to to see in the Venusian clouds. The second problem uh, is that there is very little water in the clouds of Venus, and there is just what we call it a very low water activity. There, in fact, Venusian clouds are actually 50 to 100 times drier than even the Atacama de de Desert, which is one of the driest places on Earth. So if actually, if, if Venusian life, if it exists, uh, and if it is still based on water, if it still uses water as its primary, as its solvent, it has to have some sort of adaptations and uh, that uh, have no precedent here on Earth, uh, that our life here on Earth simply did not, uh, did not develop. 
So this brings us to the following statement that if if life actually exists in the clouds of Venus, it must be life as we don't as we don't know it. The only question is to what degree, because life as as we see it as we have it here on Earth absolutely cannot survive in the environment of the clouds of Venus because of uh, the, because of these two unsurmountable challenges. This of course doesn't mean that life as a phenomenon uh, is impossible in the clouds of Venus because there are quite a few possible speculative but possible survival strategies that life could actually have. And we, rem we have to remind ourselves that the clouds of Venus are actually liquid droplets of, as we understand them, of course, of liquids concentrated sulfuric acid. And what is one of the requirements for life in general is to have some sort of liquid for its biochemistry to function. So we can speculate that what if life actually did not have this canonically habitable um, period in its in its geological history when it has these water oceans or water seas and rivers and so on and it always had this sulfuric acid liquid sulfuric acid environment as its um, uh, as its dominant dominant conditions what if it actually if life exists in the clouds what if it actually developed a completely alternative biochemistry something the one that is not actually based on water but it actually uses sulfuric, concentrated sulfuric acid instead. And it might sound like a completely uh, crazy idea, like a completely complete, like a statement from, from science fiction, especially, you know, if you start to Google things and look at the at various movies or, or, uh, or YouTube videos, you would realize that what would, for example, happen if you add concentrated sulfuric acid to sugar. Yes, these are very, specul very spectacular um, YouTube videos that show that uh, you know, you add this uh, nasty substance, uh, concentrated sulfuric acid to organic chemistry in the form of sugar. And then basically you create this rather terribly looking uh, black blob of carbon that has virtually nothing, uh, uh, nothing to do with complex organic chemistry or, or, or life. But this is actually a completely and absolutely misleading, uh, misleading experiment because this does not mean that concentrated sulfuric acid itself is actually deadly or incompatible with organic chemistry as a whole. And this is, this is, this is also a very new uh, research that is also done by my, my colleagues, by Dr. Jan Spacek, who I believe that, uh, that was also a guest of, uh, of Czech Mars Society. And he also shared some of his research with you. So I will just very briefly summarize what, what they did, he and, uh, and Professor Steve Banner, they are basically also studying also the, the, the mechanism, the chemical, the, the chemical mechanisms of organic, organic chemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid. And they were able to show unbelievably cool things from the point of view of organic chemistry, of course, and also astrobiology as well. They were, for example, able to show that complex organic chemistry is capable of two form, or new organic molecules are capable of two form uh, in this unforgiving solvent from just very simple building blocks, including atmospheric components like gases, components like carbon, carbon monoxide. So from that relatively simple laboratory experiments, you can actually derive a, a, a very, um, very important uh, point that the existence of complex organic chemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid is actually a fact. It's just what is important in to rea is to realize that if this is if this is to de to be developed into a some sort of complex biochemistry, then it has to be a biochemistry that is unlike anything that we have here on Earth, based on water um, here. So this is not, but this is of course not all. This is just the beginning of of our uh, of uh, of research that our our general collaboration actually works on, because we were also also studying this this problem of stability of organic molecules in the in concentrated sulfuric acid. And the work by um, um, Max Ziger and Professor Sarah Ziger, as well as myself, we've, we've asked a very, very simple question that apparently nobody for decades, uh, decades um, uh, actually uh, pro asked properly, what is the actual stability of, of our building blocks that we have in our own biochemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid? And, and we were absolutely, um, surprised to learn that 19 out of 20 amino acids that we actually have in our proteins that build our proteins, so our 
sort of executive branch of our biochemistry are completely stable for in concentrated sulfuric acid for many, many months, as of course studied and measured by the NMR spectroscopy. So this is quite unexpected that you would expect that concentrated sulfuric acid would chop, would chop organics into pieces and nothing would essentially, nothing interesting would, 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 would be left um, afterwards if you actually followed the logic of various YouTube videos. But this is not the reality. In some cases, in, or in actually quite a few cases, this organic chemistry is actually quite stable. They might, it might, this amino acids might be, for example, modified in, in, some, in some chemical way, but they are actually perfectly stable for, for many, many months um, in, in this unforgiving uh, solvent. Not only that, we can also test this with uh, nucleic acid bases. So the letters of our own genetic code, yes, the famous G, C, A, and T, and we now have a long-term experiment going on and we can see, we can confidently say that they are stable in concentrated sulfuric acid for more than a one year. This is also quite unexpected because we would we, we constantly perceive concentrated sulfuric acid as something that is very reactive, that would react and destroy the orga organic chemistry quite readily. So, and not moreover, we can also show, and this is these are preliminary results of of uh, my colleague Dr. Daniel Tuzdevich and and. Uh, from, um, Jack, uh, from Professor Jack Shostak lab, that, that a special membrane-like structures also do form in concentrated sulfuric acid that resemble this micelle and liposome cell-like vesicles. So this is quite interesting result. This is of course the preliminary and not yet fully published result, but, but it suggests that the biophysics or the physics behind the formation of these structures is the same in water and in concentrated sulfuric acid, the only thing you have to actually change is the building blocks, is the chemical building blocks to build those structures because they are not built from our own lipids or our own fatty acids. They are built from components or the chemical Lego blocks that are actually stable in concentrated sulfuric acid. So again, you have to tailor the organic chemistry to the solvent in which it happens, but at the end, you arrive at the same at the same solutions and at the same structures. So for example, this cell-like vesicles. There is also another possibility that it's a bit, a bit different than, than the actual chemistry in concentrated or organic chemistry or potential hypothetical biochemistry directly in concentrated sulfuric acid. But we might actually also have a situation that, that we actually remove or react away this concentrated sulfuric acid to some, um, to some extent and therefore create an environment that is more, um, more habitable from the canonical point of view. And this is, this is, um, this is some work that we actually, that we actually did with um, my colleague also, um, Dr. Paul Rimmer, the, the, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and it postulates that we could actually have a neutralization of some of the cloud particles in the clouds of Venus. So we still do not quite know what the clouds of Venus are actually made of, or we know that the concentrated sulfuric acid is the main component of the clouds, but we also know that this is not the only substance that builds those clouds. And there might be a situation that there is actually, and the, the acid is to a certain degree neutralized, so to speak, which makes it actually less deadly for the canonical biochemistry or organic chemistry that we have here on earth so you can ask you can ask yourselves okay these are all very nice modeling experiments and uh, and some uh, laboratory experiments on organic chemistry of sulfuric acid that actually suggests that the, that the chemistry that can happen in these clouds of venus might actually be much more diverse or much more interesting than we thought but do we actually have some sort of observations that would suggest that there is indeed something that could be associated with, uh, with life or could be a sign of life itself. But this is of course not a proof. And uh, by the way, we do have that because this is sort of a rhetorical question, but what is very important to, to state and very, very clearly and very categorically is that this is not by all means this uh, atmospheric or, chemi or chemical and or cloud anomalies that we, have, we were able to detect in the clouds of Venus are not the proof of life by any chance it's uh, because they might be actually a sign of some sort of unknown chemistry as well, but they allow us to put forward a hypothesis that indeed something very peculiar is going on in the clouds that could be actually explained by 
by uh, biological activity, potentially. That's why we have to go there and actually check. And what we, what we, what we have is over the decades of, ex of, of observations of the clouds of Venus, we actually amassed a lot of observations that we actually cannot explain and that we do not know and where do they fit. We do not also know which of them are actually true or which of, which of them are erroneous. But nevertheless, we have quite a few of them. And probably one of the most famous ones is the so-called anomalous absorber. This is a substance that is actually present throughout the clouds but mostly absorbs at the top of the clouds. And this is some, some when you look at the, at the planet in, in UV, you see these black streaks of, of some, something, some substance in the clouds that is highly dynamic, that follows the quasi-seasonal changes. And actually nobody knows what it is. It was detected in 1922, uh, sorry, 1928, I think. So it is almost 100 years since people try to actually explain what this phenomenon is, and we have many, many different hypotheses what type of compounds or chemicals this could be, and no uh, actual final explanation. What is quite important is that this absorber is extremely efficient. It actually absorbs up to 50% of all the light that falls onto the planet. So it's actually quite, quite, a, quite an interesting um, uh, unknown uh, phenomenon. Now, the particles of the clouds themselves are also quite interesting. Uh, there are, there were divided into three categories or modes, as we call them. Mode one, which is the smallest one. This is the, these are the schematically represented gray gray dots on this on this uh, slide that I show. We don't really. They are submicron in size. We don't know what they really are. We also have particles that are a little bit larger, few microns across and they are spherical, which means that they are most likely this main component of the clouds, which is the liquid concentrated sulfuric acid. And that is, but in the bottom layers of the clouds, in the mid or bottom layer in, and bottom layers of the clouds, we have something that we actually cannot explain. And to this day, it's a, it's a very contentious discovery and people argue uh, what this could be. These are the so-called mode three particles that, are, that were detected by the Pioneer Venus, by the American Pioneer Venus uh, probe, and they were classified as the so-called non-spherical droplets. Of course, the non-spherical drop, droplets cannot exist. This is if the if the particles are larger and non-spherical, then it means that they are not made of liquid concentrated sulfuric acid. It has to be something else. So the clouds, if these measurements are true, then it means that the clouds contain some particles that are definitely not entirely concentrated sulfuric acid, that the chemical composition of these clouds is actually much more complex than we think. And people to this day don't know what those, what those particles are made of. And some scientists even questioned if, those, if these particles actually exist, because, because maybe it, and were postulated that they are just error of the measurement. 40 years uh, forward, and we do not yet know what is the actual truth behind them. And that's why this is probably one of the most most interesting targets to actually remeasure after we go back to, to Venus. And of course, if we, if we are to talk about the anomalies of the or un unsolved mysteries of the cloud, cloud decks of Venus, we have to talk about the gases components of the atmosphere as well. So for example, the very contentious and very controversial discovery of phosphine, which I am of which I'm also part of this, of this group. But what we have to, we can discuss the phosphine discovery after the, the talk in detail. For now, I will just just uh, tell, uh, just um, mention that the discovery is very much alive. So despite all the high hiatus of, uh, in the media and that the signal is not there, that the signal is SO2, that the signal is this, that is volcanoes, that is that, that is this, this is a still a very, very heated debate. And by all means, it is not debunked or, or, or invalid. It's actually a very much, um, very much a continued research with a new uh, JCMT 100 hour or so long observational campaign led by Professor Dave Clements, I believe, right now, that it was that actually was able to reconfirm the presence of the signal. And now, of course, the debate is what the signal really is. Is this really a, is this really phosphine? It's most likely not SO2, of course, because we were because at the same time. The observations of simultaneous, or almost simultaneous SO2, actually ruled SO2 as an as an as an explanation as well. So we 
we are we are still discussing this or this is a very much a, a, a very a very a very a topic that is very much alive scientifically and the device debate still continues very interesting twist in the in the Foskin story which I maybe would briefly mention is the fact that in 2021 Professor Rakesh Mogul looked at very very old data from Pioneer well not very but 40 year old data from Pioneer Venus uh, probe from the mass spectrometer that was that was present there in in, in the clouds in situ and found also a a detection or tentative detection in the form of P plus ion that was um, that was assigned as phosphine. So in the legacy data, you actually could, in principle, have a confirmation, an independent confirmation of the phosphine discovery, uh, completely through a different way uh, from in situ probe and not from remote observations as well. And this and in this case, of course, in the middle of the clouds, but. Phosphine aside, we have to realize that phosphine is just the newest, uh, most recent anomaly that the clouds of Venus actually have, because we have others. And one of those very interesting uh, anomalies is also the possible presence of ammonia. Ammonia was actually detected by the Venera 8 probe in 1974. The Venera 8 probe had a chemical sensor that was designed to detect ammonia through chemical reaction, and it gave positive result. Soon after, it was actually dis discarded as erroneous because it, because it was postulated that the probe reacted unspecifically with the concentrated sulfuric acid in the clouds. So it was, so it was deemed erroneous. We have to realize that at that time, people don't, not, did not exactly understand that the clouds of Venus are actually made from concentrated sulfuric acid. So not all of the instruments that were flown in the early missions were actually um, were actually designed in a way to survive the concentrated or to operate properly in the concentrated sulfuric acid environment. So, is the Venera eight um, detection true or not? We don't know. Uh, but in again in two thousand and twenty one, the reanalysis of the Pioneer Venus uh, data again hinted the presence of ammonia again, and the, and this actually reopened the question of the presence of ammonia in the clouds of Venus once again, 50 or so years after the original detection or after the original detections were actually discarded. We, when we talk about the um, ammonia, we have to also mention that there are also hints and, or, or, or the presence of more oxidized nitrogen species. So various nitrogen oxides, for example. And if we take together the nitrogen oxides, the ammonia, potential ammonia detection, and also atmospheric nitrogen, then what we actually have together is a, is a fantastic nitrogen cycle that looks almost, and almost exactly like our own nitrogen cycle that we know here from Earth that, the, that our microorganisms are also responsible for. So if these nitrogen species detections are actually true, then we have a potential for nitrogen by sort of quasi or hypothetically biological nitrogen cycle that could itself actually be a biosignature. What is even more interesting and what was also quite actually forgotten because nobody actually could explain it at that time, or we cannot explain it today as well, if, if, we, if we were to be honest, is the detection of molecular oxygen. Because of course we have oxygen O2 in our own atmosphere in a very, very large amounts. The, our oxygen is clearly a biosignature. It is actually a, a, a result of a photosynthesis. There, were, there was a detection in the clouds of Venus of O2, of oxygen, in the amounts that are much, of course, much lower than our own oxygen in our own atmosphere. But nevertheless, in amounts of 20 or so parts per billion, it is still too much to actually be explained by any known chemical processes that we expect to happen on Venus. And this is a one, one of the rare situations where both Americans and the Russians agree on something regarding measurements. Here, we actually have detection from both Venera 14 and Pioneer Venus at the same altitudes in the clouds uh, of O2 in the same amounts. This is a very contentious detection because uh, you cannot see any O2 above the clouds. So that is very, very puzzling, because then it means that this oxygen is, if, we, if the detections by Venera and Pioneer are true, 
then it is actually localized to the clouds or to the bottom or, or to the layers below the clouds. So this, the question of oxygen actually uh, remains open and it was never revisited uh, properly with any in situ probes. And this is also something that actually, in my opinion, should be, should be, uh, should be tested. We have other minor anomalies, like for example, the presence of, of um, hydrogen sulfide at various altitudes, and also some anomalies that are associated not with the identity of the gas that is unexpected in the clouds of Venus, but the abundance profile that this gas actually has. And in this case, you have a situation in which, in which you have the sulfur dioxide abundance profile that is very peculiar. You have, we have a lot of sulfur dioxide above the, below the clouds. And then when we enter the clouds, the, uh, the sulfur dioxide abundance actually drops precipitously very much. So it doesn't, so we do not, we, we have very little of it above the clouds, in the clouds, and very much quite a bit of it below. And, no, and since, uh, since, the, since the original detections were made, it is now decades, decades long mystery. People try to come up with hypotheses and models that explain this, this, um, this profile, this abundance profile, and and we still do not know exactly why such a such such um, such a profile would would exist. But but of course the the presence of of sulfur dioxide as a gas it's expected on Venus because it's a volcanic volcanic gas that that actually we know uh, we know uh, is is produced there uh, quite efficiently. We have to also realize that while I mentioned and we all know that Venus is very very water scarce or water depleted there are both measurements from pioneer venus and venera probes that locally suggest the larger anomalously high concentrations on of water and this is something that also is quite peculiar it was dismissed by uh, as erroneous but we still don't know why such measurements were act, act, why these results were actually uh, are so are so peculiar because they are in clear contrast with the globally um with the globally depleted atmosphere of venus or or or, or, or with um with this very very low abundance of or um, of, of water throughout the atmosphere of venus and of course there is also a question are there organics in the in the clouds um, of uh, of venus this this is a question that is very new that we now uh, together with our collaborators try to answer Nobody, no previous mission and no, no, no plan mission, planned missions actually try to, try to answer this question directly. Uh, the detections, previous detections of methane uh, of, by both Pioneer Venus and Venera were most likely an artifact from the spacecraft itself. So we cannot really, really, um, um, we cannot really be sure that the detection of methane from, the, from, the, um, from those probes is correct. It is very likely an artifact, but nevertheless, the question about the presence of the or, of organics in the clouds of Venus is a very much uh, a valid one. So, what where does this brings us to? Uh, to what? Uh, well, this brings us to the following point that we actually have no idea what is going on here, and we if and most importantly, which of those measurements are actually correct or not? Because if they are all correct, then essentially. This, uh, this chemical picture of the atmosphere makes absolutely completely no sense. Then it means that there is a lot, some sort of chemistry that we completely do not understand. Or, of course, we can put forward this hypothesis that all of this weirdness is actually caused by something that lives in the clouds. Because we know that life actually can do weird things. And it's continuously maintaining this weirdness. And because what we would need for this, all, all of these observations to be true is to have a continuous source of these gases that otherwise shouldn't be there together because they would react together with each other quite efficiently and with the main components of the clouds as well. So our main point, main question should be, if we were to ask the astrobiological questions of, about Venus cloud, is which of those decades long anomalies of the clouds of Venus in the clouds of Venus are actually correct and which are the errors of the measurements or some some sort of um, uh, some sort of other other modeling problems or or any or or, or 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 such and what we actually try to do is we try to actually answer just that 
we try to we I, I have a privilege of being a, a deputy PI of a consortium uh, that's called Morningstar Mission Slovenia. And what we actually try to achieve is to develop a missions, a series of missions to Venus that have astrobiology at its core, at its focus. And we are not afraid of that. We are actually trying to go to Venus, to the clouds, to study the clouds and answer these decades long anomalies. So, so we can actually get more information about the clouds, their habitability, and maybe even to find some signs of life there. And what we have, what we currently work on, we have series of missions plans and uh, we call them small, medium and large missions. And we are very fortunate because we, we've partnered with the with Rocket Lab for our for the first for the first mission, um, which we call the Rocket Lab mission to Venus. We have, of course, the uh, other plans as well for the medium mission that are both inspired by the pioneer Venus um, parachute probe, as well as Vega balloon missions. And we, of course, want to culminate our activities with the atmospheric sample return mission. And why it is? Because we otherwise, we will never find the proof of life anywhere if we actually do not bring it to the lab on Earth and study it properly with our analytical chemistry and chemistry equipment here. So eventually to get any kind of proof of anything, we actually have to bring the samples back here. The rocket lab mission, is the first in a series, hopefully, and basically, this is a very small mission in its design and scope, but an ex but with very bold and important science goals. So we the launch is currently planned to be in January 2025. We we have a very small payload and instrument that is less than a kilogram uh, kilogram um, in in its in its weight. Uh, so it's very low mass. But, uh, but at the same, and we will spend in the in the clouds only a few minutes from three to five minutes, but this is going to be enough to do all the magical science that we actually try to do. And what we will actually do is something that nobody before actually tried to do, which is to find organic chemistry in the clouds of Venus. And of course, the organic chemistry is not life. Yes, that has to be said for the record because so it is not put out of context, but the point is that it is, but that there is no life without organic chemistry. So if you if you actually find that there is organic chemistry and that the organic chemistry could be potentially quite complex, then you automatically increase the chances for the clouds to be to be habitable. And what we actually have uh, in, on the Rocket Lab mission is the very unique instrument. It's an, it's called Auto Fluorescence Nephelometer. And we can risk the statement that this is the best developer in the world currently, developed by the group of Dr. Daler, Darrell Baumgartner. And what is actually going to do is going to give us, is going to study the cloud particles in detail. So it's, it's going to resolve this decades long discussion and anomalies about how the particles of the, how, how large the particles of the clouds are. Do we indeed have three modes of particles? And what is the shape of particles? So we will be able to actually answer this a lingering question, do we actually have a very weird non-spherical particles in the bottom of the, at the bottom of the clouds that pioneer Venus detected? And because if yes, then it is clear that this not, that not all particles in the clouds are concentrated liquid sulfuric acid. But most importantly, what we have is we have this auto fluorescence or fluorescence detection component, which is quite important. We are going to shine the laser through the probe. We are going to excite whatever is in the particle, and then basically detect the fluorescence that the, that the particles, hopefully, that the material in the particles, hopefully, is going to, to, mm, to, um, mm, to fluoresce. And basically, what we are going to hope to detect is fluorescence that is going to be indicative of the presence of organic chemistry. This is the way to detect organic chemistry, but not identify. Uh, what organic chemicals are present in the particles. So we would not know if this is just some benzene molecule dissolved in the in the cloud particle, or if this is actually the entire cell floating in it. But uh, this is the first step. We have to first establish that there is a chance, or there is indeed a chance for organic chemistry, and this is and this is where we are. And this is of course. Uh, a uh, shout out here is a good, a good, good place to also shout, uh, shout uh, to 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 in, input a, a shout out to Dr. Jan Spacek and his group and uh, and Professor Steve Banner because they are also uh, participating quite 
um, quite actively in the in the development of um, of these uh, experiments that are actually guiding this uh, this uh, uh, the development of the of the instrument itself. What we are going to have again, the mission itself is very short and small in scope, but the, uh, we are going to only reside in the clouds for only a couple of minutes. We are just going to essentially drop a brick into the clouds, but this is going to be enough. The five minutes is going to be enough to make the measurements that we want to measure with the uh, with the auto fluorescence nephelometer, and then send the data back to Earth for analysis. And of course, rocket lab mission is hopefully just the first step in the series of missions that we plan to develop. Each of them successively is going to be, we hope to be much more complex than the previous one. And the second one that we conceptually now develop uh, so, um, is the so-called Morning Star Habitability mission. This mission is either envisioned as a parachute probe, which is quite likely, or a maybe small balloon. We are still toying with various concepts. But what is more important is that we actually try to establish or have much more um, sophisticated or much, much, much more broad science objectives for these missions. First of all, we really would like to understand what are the what is the habitability of the clouds? What are the habitability indicators, for example? So, first, so for example, figure out how much water we really have in the clouds. We would like to determine the acidity of the cloud droplets. We know that it's concentrated sulfuric acid. This is pretty well established, but how much acid there is, actually, it is still an open question. As this was never directly measured, it was always inferred that the concentration, the, that the, that the, the concentrations of acid were always inferred rather than directly measured. We also would like to, of course, uh, measure all kinds of cl cloud particles composition, maybe including some measurements or, or identification of various metals, a metal ion dissolves, dissolved in the, in the cloud particles, as well as, of course, we are, you have to remind ourselves, we are an astrobiology missions at its core, which means that we have to, we, and we will share, search for evidence of life. And this involves all of this, for example, create these crazy trace gases that were detected over the last 50 or so years, and nobody knows which of those detections are actually true and which are wrong. So we would like to revisit that. We would like to find out which of those various um, reduced, um, uh, reduced molecules and other gases are actually true and which are not. We would like to, again, detect the presence of organic materials, but this time we hope to actually shed more light on what this material actually is, if detected. And at the end, of course, we will get information how much or to what extent the clouds of Venus are actually homogeneous or how, how heterogeneous, in other words, they are. Are they made from the same material throughout the altitudes of the cloud or maybe they are actually present in some distinct layers as, for example, Pioneer Venus actually suggested. And we have many, many different potential instruments that we could consider for this for this type of mission. I, I would not go into details here because this is, of course, still being worked on. I maybe just give a shout out to uh, to my colleague, Professor Mikhail Payosalu from, from the Tartu Observatory from Estonia, but he's developing a very unique instrument that is called TOPS, and this is a single particle acidity sensor. So this is essentially a, a, a sensor in which could which could be able to actually, which will be able to detect the acidity of single droplets as the droplets actually hit the hit the plate, uh, sensor plate. And that's important because what we would like to know, first of all, how, how acidity the droplets are, but second of all, we also would like to know if all of the droplets are of equal acidity, because maybe there are actually some differences there uh, as well. And at the end, of course, we hope to actually bring the atmospheric samples back to Earth, not only the atmospheric gases, uh, of, but also the cloud matter, cloud particle matter as well. And this is by more of a conceptual drawing. Most of the technologies that we need for that does not exist. Or it's so early in the development that it's up to us to actually figure out how to actually do this because nobody before even, uh, well, there are some, for example, there is, a, there is, there is a, the, one of the crucial ideas behind the atmospheric sample return um, is the launching a return rocket or with a sample from a balloon. 
And there are some companies on Earth that actually try to do such a such a feat. Um, we have to know that we are also going. We, if we were to do this, and we we will we will we will have an infinitely more difficult problem because it would be done on another planet. <laughs> so that's why I say that a lot of technologies that that this concept actually postulates um, are still require a lot of development. So I hope that this is going to be done in my lifetime. Uh, I'm not going to go on uh, on any retirement, I guess. <laughs> But it is a very, um, it is a, it is probably a, a concept that is, if realized, it's going to, it's going to be for the 40s or, or maybe even 50s. Who knows? But nevertheless, this is something that we also work because uh, work on because we have to actually move forward this concept and um, move 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 these concepts forward. So to actually summarize, what we really really uh, what I really would like to um, stress is that Venus is really a compelling astrobiology. Uh, it's, it's a very really compelling astrobiology target for space exploration. Contrary to the our contrary to our our first impressions of the planet, there are many many anomalies in the clouds of Venus that we have to revisit and we have to actually ask the question: Are they true? And to what extent? Which are one of them? Are, which one of them are true? And which one of them are wrong? And so on. And we have to ask. So we so because so we have to actually we would like to actually solve this once and for all. And this is our main our main objective. Um, we would like to move Venus to the forefront of the astrobiology research. And of course, this work wouldn't be possible without many, 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 many people uh, that I, who, um, who I would like to really, really, th really thank for, for all the hard work. And I'm just one, one spokesperson for the entire team. But of course, there are many thanks to, to, to our industry partners. And also, um, of course, to Professor Tara Digger, who is the leader of the entire initiative, and without her, nothing that I told you today is act, would be would be actually possible. So huge thanks to to her and to the entire to the entire team. And I will stop here, and we can have all kinds of questions and all kinds of discussions. And I welcome all all um, all points. Thank you very much. I think it was a really interesting talk. So uh, I first ask if there are any questions from somebody. I have several, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, first, you mentioned which was very surprising to me that there was the uh, extra measurement or detection of the phosphine in the Venus atmosphere. I, I didn't see it anywhere in, in any media. Oh, the, the Pioneer Venus reanalysis? You said, you said that some different group has some... Uh, oh, uh, time. Yeah. no, I mean, this is, this is uh, well, this is the, the, the group. Uh, so the, there is a JCMT um, the campaign, uh, campaign. Reobserve Venus that is currently ongoing uh. under the leadership of Professor Dave Clements. Professor Dave Clements was involved or is involved in the phosphine detection, uh, but he is now uh, he is the, the leader of that re, re, reinvigorated, let's call it like that, observation of GMS, JCMT. Mm -hmm. This is this is because JCMT actually can be can be relatively. Well, I'm not I, I'm not an expert in that in in this type of observations, but JCMT actually has a reasonable non-contentious chance of actually detecting the signal. Yes. So what we are actually trying to because what we have to actually realize that in the media hiatus that uh, that that happened after the 2020 detection our critics also did not agree with themselves mm -hmm. that the media somehow failed to report. Because, for example, you cannot have a situation when you have no signal and the signal is also SO2 or sulfur dioxide. Yes? <laughs> so, uh, well, this is a pure logic. You do not even have to know how to observe the Venus to realize that there cannot be two this that these two statements cannot be true at the same time. So we have to realize that as the phosphine detection uh, 
or this discovery progresses and the knowledge and research on it progresses, then also the controversy shifts between from one thing to another. And at the first at the first level, it was well, we can imagine that there are essentially three levels of, of controversy that can be can be uh, put forward. The first is the signal the, there. That's the first. Is this a statistical anomaly or this is, or this or is this is the signal there? Is this not? And so on. The second layer of of controversy is is that what is the interpretation of the signal? So if the signal is there, then is this really phosphine or is this something else that was interpreted as phosphine, for example, wrongly, and in, in, in reality, it is something else. And the third layer of, inter of, of controversy, let's call it like that, or a scientific discussion, as we should say, is if this is phosphine, then what is making it? on Venus? What process is actually responsible for making it? And all of those three layers of, of uh, scientific debate are were happening simultaneously, yes? Of course, if you, if you have a debate on what makes phosphine, and phosphine is made by volcanoes, and there is a universe, let's say that it is, well, it's not, but let's say, uh, then, and simultaneously you have a discussion if there is a is the if the signal is real then obviously you know there is also so these are sort of a, also to a degree disjointed discussions as well but nevertheless this is fantastic because this is what science is all about you actually need these discussions and I I actually was I am actually really really happy that this is happening now let's circle back so phosphine discovery let's say three and a half years later. The discovery is still pretty much alive and the discussion is actually happening around it. Now, it shifted more from the signal, is the signal there, to what the signal actually is. Mm -hmm. Because we can say that, the, we can say, let's say, uh, that the detection from ALMA is very controversial because ALMA is actually not the best detect, not the best instrument to actually try this. But with that said, it, does that mean that we shouldn't try to detect it with it? Yes. If this is def difficult, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be tried. That's very important. Yes. So you know, everybody who is shouting that ALMA shouldn't be used for this. Okay. Well, that's great. Points taken. But is, does this mean that we shouldn't actually try to see it with it? So ALMA detection is, let's say, a bit controversial because people do not believe that the ALMA signal is real, even if we can show, let's say, from our point of view, or from Professor Jane Greaves' point of view and Dr. Anija Ichar's point of view, the signal is there and also. So let's put that aside. But the JCMT signal, so the another, uh, another uh, radio telescope that was used for the post-spin observations, this we can call it an, an, uh, an, uh, uh, um, an independent well, it's a different telescope, so it's technically an independent discovery, was recovered not only by us, yes? So our critics also, this, some, of the, some of our critics wrote a paper that the signal in JCMT is um, in, not there, uh, but other critics said that the signal, they recovered the signal and it is indeed there. So now the discovery, the discussion is that, okay, the signal in JCMT is there, what it is, and therefore this is where this further this this um, this more uh, this later papers came to came to uh, later critique papers came to be, which are the signal is just sulfur dioxide, yes, and the reason why they they had an idea that that the signal is 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 sulfur dioxide is because the the, the lines the two lines are actually pretty close to each other, and maybe we can. Maybe they are confused and so on. So Professor Jane Greaves wrote a paper that also maybe didn't get enough traction in the in the media that actually showed that the observations with GCMT with the same telescope, but done only six or five days or I forgot few days from her observations, observations of SO two actually excluded this signal as an SO2 because you would have to have such unbelievable unbelievable variation in SO2 concentration in the cloud in the above the clouds or in the cloud or wherever you detect it 
that it is and so either you either you assume that you have extreme variations like 10 times within a couple of days mm. or this is not so 2 like completely not because the almost simultaneous observations actually could potentially exclude that now so let's say that we have that the the there is of course a possibility and we we have to we have to put that forward and we put this in our own papers as well that by, that by some absolutely miraculous chance, there is an absorption line of, of some unknown molecule in this region that phosphine absorbs. Yes? Which is not impossible. But in the millimeter wavelength region of the spectrum, it is unlikely because there's not so much absorption spectra, uh, features there and so on. But okay, for the sake of, let's say, scientific honesty or how you would call it, we have to put this forward and we actually said that okay this could be some unknown whatever thing but how likely is that now from that controversy what is the interpretation of the signal there is this there is another sort of sub controversy that stem out of it that is actually quite interesting where does the signal come from so how high in the atmosphere this signal really is yes because the original detection of, of, if you read the original paper, Professor Jane Greaves claimed that the signal is actually from in the clouds or at the top clouds and so on. The subsequent reanalysis of the signal and the recovery of the signal by our critics suggests that the signal comes from the upper above the cloud regions. So, so this is where the interesting thing is. Also, regarding that sort of uh, angle of criticism, if this is if this is if this is if this signal comes from the clouds, from from the uh, above the clouds, then how it is phosphine? If we would expect phosphine to be photochemically destroyed almost instantaneously above the clouds, so you would expect a lot of phosphine to be produced below the in the clouds so it diffuses up and gets detected in the tiny amounts that we detected the tiny amounts but these tiny amounts are still enough it's too much what you would expect if you had it above the clouds or our photochemical models are about. <laughs> so uh, maybe there are and that's also a possibility. Uh, maybe our assumptions about how phosphine behaves in the cloud, in, in the atmosphere of Venus, and what is its lifetime, and so on, is actually wrong. Or maybe this is not phosphine. Or maybe it is actually made in the above the clouds through some weird photochemistry that we completely do not understand. Also, we don't know. On top of that. You have extremely, you have very nice paper by Professor Rakesh Mogul that reanalyzed the pioneer Venus mass spectrometer data that collected the data on the gaseous constituents of the atmosphere from the altitude of 51 kilometers in the clouds. And there he detected the P plus ion in the spectra. Now there is a huge discussion in the paper about what to assign this P plus ion to, yes? But without going into much detail, the conclusion of the paper is that phosphine gas is the best molecule that fits the data. Yes? And that, because first of all, I mean, just to simplify things a, a, a bit more, of course, simplify the things a little bit, you do not have that many gases phosphorus species. And effectively, phos phosphine is the only one, and organophosphines are the only ones that are volatile at that temperatures where the sample was collected. And this was a gaseous sample, which means that if you get P plus ion that is very solidly assigned, then what type of gaseous molecule that it is that could, that contains phosphorus atom. Maybe, very unlikely, very unlikely, at these temperature regimes, this could be some phosphorus oxide. Uh, unlikely. 
they would not they would also probably not form this type of ions but this is this is sort of i mean the entire this is still of course not a proof of phosphine it's just hey this is a piece of evidence that actually puts a little pebble into the or the, the into the basket of, of team phosphine let's call it like that but nevertheless so this this is this is still ongoing um, this discussion is still ongoing we will see what the great what the long JCMT campaign is actually going to 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 show. Uh, we know now from from various presentations that that Dr. Dave Clements gave and Dr. Jane Greaves as well that the, there is a recovery of this signal, but that's expected because the because even our critics recover the JCMT signal as well. The, the the debate probably is going to continue. We actually have to if we were to resolve the phosphine discovery. We have to go there and have an in situ measurement with, for example, tunable laser spectrometer that has a resolution that will, by all, will, with no doubt, show that this is phosphine and not something else, for example. And, and uh, apart from that, we have various upper limits from infrared that are largely negative. Yes. Regarding the SOFIA upper limit, there is a back of, of in infrared. There is essentially back and forth between Professor Jane Greaves and and the, and the coordinator team on the how to interpret the data and how to actually recover the signal and so on and so on. And from that, depending on how you recover the signal, you either get the phosphine line or you do not get the phosphine line. Yes. Well, that's of course not. A, it's not going to be resolved because Sofia is no longer in in operation. Yes, and 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 essentially, uh, you know, you like this type of data analysis, then go for it. You like that one, you go for it. What we really, to resolve this problem, we really have to actually have an in situ measurement. But what I actually would stress is that the phosphine debate is is a, is a little is different than is their life debate. Mm -hmm. Yes, they might be related. But they are not the same, and they are. And they are. So even if, let's say, the phosphine discovery completely disappears, this by all means doesn't invalidate the idea that Venus is an uninhabited world because of that. And second of all, uh, because as I said, I mean, first of all, we have we have many other things to, to study about it, and and uh, and, uh, and 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 the life hypothesis doesn't hang on the phosphine discovery, yes? Well, I mean, I can say the following, that in my private, phosphine is weird, even as a biosignature. So three and a half years later, I actually think, if you were ask me three and a half, year, half, three and a half years later, after the phosphine discovery, I would actually say that it's probably more likely that phosphine itself is made by something, some unusual chemistry in the clouds of Venus or below the clouds of Venus, they directly below the clouds of Venus, than life. And the reason for it is very simple. Uh, uh, not simple, actually. The reason for it is, uh, as, as Professor Steve Banner once said in his blog, evolutionary, not chemical. And that's a very good point, because if we think about it, life always is limited by certain elements, the abundance of elements. What is the limiting factor for life on Venus? A limiting element for life on Venus. Not the same elements that we have here on Earth. It's not phosphorus. There is going to be quite a bit of phosphorus from down below, let's say. But hydrogen, Venus is extremely hydrogen depleted. That's why there is no water there, essentially. So to, to run its biochemistry, life needs this hydrogen like, like crazy. Why would you, if you were alive, why would you produce phosphine gas that takes a lot of energy? And that's why, by the way, we cannot explain it. If it is there, then the one, one main of the problems is that it is actually thermodynamically unfavored to, to be produced. So you have to come up with some convoluted, weird way to produce it. Life is the convoluted way to produce it as a hypothesis, of course, but there might be some other way, weird ways to do that. So the question is, why if you were if, if phosphine is a biosignature or a or, or a product of life, 
why would you produce it and then throw it away as a gaseous product, a, a gaseous product that contains three hydrogen atoms that you could actually use for something else than just throwing it away? And by the way, this might sound like a crazy idea to do, but maybe this is just lack of our scientific uh, imagination, because maybe there is a reason, evolutionary reason for life to do this. Yes, that we don't understand. And we just think that this is ridiculous to just throw it away. After all, our own life does ridiculous things that make no sense at the first glance and then are extremely important. Like, for example, why, why the you know, peacock has its tail? Yes, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And until you study peacocks in more detail and their behavior and everything, and you suddenly realize that it's actually extremely crucial for survival of the peacock. <laughs> Even if it does, of course, this is a little bit ridiculous comparison, but the, the philosophy behind the comparison stands. So now the, so the phosphine question is open, the controversy is still there, and the research on phosphine is, is, is still very much open. What we definitely did is we steered the pot, and what I'm really happy about is that we also resurfaced all of these anomalies from, the, from decades before, 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 from decades before because they were forgotten. And in some instances, even they were said that, and this is, this, is, this is a quote, which I often bring up, and I will paraphrase it now, so forgive me, it is not going to be the, the direct quote, but the initial detection of oxygen was dismissed, and this is where I paraphrased, to, uh, how to say this, to, uh, to pre preserve the model of atmos of chemical equilibrium, uh, to, 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 to preserve the model of, of, of chemical equilibrium of the atmosphere of Venus. And this is a paraphrase of the quote because I don't have the text in front of me, but this is something like that. What, and this is from the 80s, from the 83, from 1983, a quote from, 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 a, from a chapter in a book from 1993. And this is not how you should do it. If you, have an op if you have a measurement that you cannot explain, you try to modify your model so it actually explains the observation and not discard the observation to save the model. And I don't know if this was the reason why these anomalies disappeared. Hmm. 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 They, they wanted probably to to do, they wanted to do everything to essentially maybe put this into within this established model at that time. Well, I don't know what they what they what they were thinking. What I can only say is that I also cannot claim that these anomalies are true. What I can claim is that we actually have to scientifically ex re-examine these detections. That's it. Because we cannot rule them out on the basis of, for example, some, in all cases at least, we cannot examine, we, can do, we cannot rule them out from, from pure, for example, instrument malfunction or something. Okay, sorry for this no, no, no. unbelievably wrong rambling, but I would rather hear from you than me giving an, another lecture or a monologue on the history of Venus science. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. No. The end. You have questions? Okay. Yeah. If I may, uh, Dr. Petkovsky, uh, what is the thing that you most need preparing this mission? I mean, for example, the the first coming mission, not the return sample. I see that there is a lot of unknown. So what is the basic obstacle is it, is it the design of experiments or or the instruments itself? <laughs> oh, the basic uh, obstacles. I think I think that every every member of our team is going to have a different answer for this. Be because because for Professor for Dr. Darrell Baumgartner and the instrument developer and building team is going to be a purely engineering problems of some although the instrument is developed and it works properly you know I mean I'm pretty sure that they have 
their own specific challenges. For uh, for others, it might be it might be some uh, laboratory experiments that they try to do that it will guide the mission. For example, uh, I would say that I, if I were to put it collectively and you know put all of these all of these subjective uh, challenges from each of our sub teams, I would say that this is the unknowns. We we when we when we started to study Venus and we actually um, we are new people like we are not established Venus science like we are not one of the old guards old guard who studied this planet we suddenly joined the Venus uh, Venus uh, community with our highly contentious 2020 paper so uh, you see uh, but when we started studying Venus we realized how little is actually known about this planet and how little is actually solidly established. So imagine that we, for example, I mean, so so we do everything in our power to be prepared for the unknown. But we might, so what I'm afraid of is always I'm afraid of, for example, for false negatives. Okay, let's say that we do not detect organics. What does it mean? Oh, maybe we aligned the. Maybe we chose the wrong way. <laughs> like, you know, like uh, uh, maybe or maybe not. Or, or I don't think so. I mean, Dr. Jan Spacek and Professor Steve Banner. This went. There went. There were. There were. There went a lot of. There was a lot of thought given to this, and their help and their research was absolutely phenomenal. But this is still unknown. Yes, we don't know what organics are there. Yes for example. So we might miss it by accident, just by accident. It's nobody's fault, but we might miss it. What if we miss it? What if we? What if, what if the levels of organics are, they are there, but they are simply too scarce, too low, and so on. We have to realize, for example, that if life exists in the, in the Venusian clouds, it's going to be very sparse biosphere. It's not going to be like, you know, a jungle that, that we have in the Amazon, yes? It's going to be very, very little of it. And from that point of view, it's, it's also very difficult, very easy to miss it. So false negatives is one of the nightmares. There are also false positives. What if you actually detect it? Are we going to have another, another 40 years of discussions like with Pioneer Venus? With, are, they, are there mode three particles real or are there mode three particles detected by rocket lab mission with the with the AFN real or not? Is the fluorescence that AFN detected real or not? These are of course these are of course questions that every scientist and every engineer and every uh, always is going to to have to tackle with. But nevertheless this is something that we have to have in mind. And we try to solve it, all of it, to the best of our ability and be prepared for it. But we actually venture into an into the into an into an environment that actually is truly unknown. So we don't know. Maybe we will detect something that is completely unexpected, and maybe this will give a false negative, false positive signal that will that maybe our interpretation is going to be wrong. This is something that I'm of course afraid, or not afraid, that I consider. But you never should be afraid to do it. You never should be afraid to do research and ask questions, even if people think that this is nonsense. Because we are there to prove them that it is not. So I guess that's my, again, very lengthy answer. So at least the designs of experiments or, or the procedures are ready and set what to what way you will detect uh, this or uh, answer some questions? Yeah, uh, I mean, we are as prepared as we can possibly be in terms of preparatory science, in terms of the instrument development, in terms of the instrument design. And this is also, of course, uh, again, uh, the team uh, on the organic chemistry side of things. It's not only us, then Professor Sarah Ziger and uh, her son, Max Ziger, but also Dr. Jan Spacek and Professor Steve Benner are a huge part of the preparatory science ahead of the mission, yes, because essentially what we, what we would like to so we would like to test their, for example, ideas on the organic chemistry in the clouds of Venus, yes, and because 
they start from the point of view, and, uh, and I see that Jan is on the on the chat to suddenly join. So this is great because you will have you you can have it from the from the very very person who is working on this as well. They started from the very very basic components. So this is something. This is into to aim to start from something that we really expect there to be on Venus. Yes, because if okay, let's say that we were we went there and we have some crazy idea about alternative biochemistry that doesn't make, that you know it's very 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 subjective. It might be a complete complete you know nonsense because we cannot predict really that what we will expect. But if we start from a basic, very basic components and, and organic chemistry and, or, and reactions, chemical reactions that have to, or I would say, are very likely to happen, then you have a higher chance of actually succeeding. Yes? And that in detections. And that's the, that's the thing. So, so we do in everything in our power to actually get prepared, not only on the engineering side with the instruments building and developers, but also in the laboratory experiments that that we do in preparation for the for the mission. Why? It is extremely important because, again, we are not we don't we not do not know enough about this environment. So we have to, like for like no mission before asked about organic chemistry in the clouds of Venus. None. And by the way, the future missions, the NASA, ESA, and so on, they don't ask this question still. So we are the first to ask this question. How do we actually, so how do we prepare to ask, to ask this question when there is no information that is available? You have to create the information and you start from that, from the laboratory experiments. And this is what our team does. This is what Professor Steve Banner and Dr. Jan Spacek actually do. And that's, that's very, very valuable. And that's what, that, because this actually is guiding us into a certain extent. But of course, we can detect something that, oh my God, is again unexpected, and it's a daily job for us. But I think I mean that's the point, right? That uh, if the Venus is the frontier of astrobiology, which seems to be because of these anomalies, you will you will detect things which are unexpected. So, so in that sense, it's it's very troubling because every unexpected is will be contested. Oh yeah, I but think look, that's, that's I, what uh, you were saying basically, you have to prepare for all the all the things people will drop at you. I will say, and I see that the, I am a gladiator when it comes to science. Yeah. So I I am not a I'm not afraid of controversy. Yes. So what is very important is that um, I, I often joke that people sometimes ask me, okay, what what is my job? And I often say, uh, jokingly, but it's it's funny because it's true. My job is to dismantle scientific consensus. Yes, because what I actually think is that science is not about building scientific consensus; it's about challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. So it's so essentially, if we were to follow the scientific consensus, then we would be still in an era of chemical equilibrium, atmospheric chemistry, you know, chemical equilibrium model of, of Venus from 1980s and so on, yes? And we will still try to, you know, do the, the, the work like Professor Jane Greaves did is extremely important because it actually starts, to, because it at least asks the question about something that is unexpected, yes? Okay, this might, let's say that the phosphine discovery, you know, it's going to go away and so on. I don't believe that, but let's say that it is then it is still valuable to ask these questions. Why? Look what type of a snowball effect it actually had. Indirectly or directly, indi we can argue about that, but indirectly it, 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 it led to, it, it led to all of these new discoveries that nobody bothered to actually check. For example, the organic chemistry in sulfuric acid. Everybody would still think that sugar plus sulfuric acid is bad, therefore everything is bad. Yes? Everybody would think that, oh yeah, you know what? This, these anomalies, they were just debunked and they just disappeared. Nobody would revisit that question again. Yes? That's the, that's, so that is very important in science to actually never be afraid to ask the question, 
you know, never be afraid to ask the question. And I'm never going to be afraid to ask the question. And whenever, when we are going to be publishing our results from Rocket Lab, Rocket, Rocket Lab mission, there is going to be a lot of controversy, but I am going to be there in the forefront to, to, the, to fight this, scientifically, of course. And I know that we are going to have a fantastic team that is going to fight together with us. Yes? That's it. And I think that this is going to be fun. So I look forward to it. I really look forward to it. Uh, by the way, this is another thing that I have to say. I like when people challenge us. Yes? Why? Because this allows you, like I'm not married to my ideas or my hypotheses, or I'm not, not you know, I'm not obsessive about, for example, phosphine being there, uh, oxygen being there, ammonia being there, organic chemistry, building biochemistry, and so on, so on. I'm not. But what I really like is when people actually challenge us, they sometimes actually come up with something interesting. Yes? They actually point to something that we didn't think. Like our uh, extremely boring, uh, I can say this because William Baines jokes about this himself, our extremely boring phosphine paper about what it is not made of, yes, <laughs> which is like 120 pages long. It's actually a collection of people's ideas what it could be made of and why by one, one by one, shooting them down. It is extremely boring, but it was also a fun thing to do in a sense that you, that we actually could collect this feedback from various people. Oh, what about lightning? Oh, what about this? Oh, what about volcanoes? And oh, what about that? And blah, 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 blah. And so, and then basically look at it very, very rigorously, scientifically, and say, no, if this cannot be this, this cannot be this, this cannot be this, then we have something else very weird going on. And so I welcome any kind of comments or any kind of criticism because some of this criticism actually has something to it. And in, uh, in a sense that it gives us more information and it, and it can channel us into some new avenues. And also this gives us insight into how people think. So for example, what part of the 2020 paper we written in a way that was not clear to people or that was misunderstood, that was not written in a way that was easy to, to, um, to convey. And then we can essentially, for in our future paper, we can, we, papers, we can also correct the language and the way how, it, how things were communicated, if such shortcomings were present. So that's that's fine. So any kind of criticism, please shoot freely because I'm not going to be offended. Yes. I, I would like to ask some journalist-like question. Sure. So if you if you were to boil down your research for a layman to a single number. So what is the what is it, what is by your by your estimation what is the probability that there is some life in clouds of Venus? Like, ah. like I would I would say ten years ago like zero percent. So maybe you give me higher number or something like that. So me and William Baines and frankly, frankly, uh, William Baines mostly because uh, because because he he. He, 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 he needed a cheerleader when he was writing this paper. So, I mean, he's mostly him. We actually wrote a paper about the statistics of belief in life in our own solar system through in the astrobiology community. It was a proper sociology paper when we had all these forms, you know, like all of this stuff. <laughs> and, and the results of that are quite interesting. It's after the phosphine discovery, there was a measurable uptick in the belief that there is uh, life on Venus. Not that, of course, it's still the, probably the least popular planet when it comes to in the astrobiology community because it's so weird, so wildly different than any other place in our own solar system that could be potentially inhabited. But it, but it, but it has some increase. 
I, in my early interviews that I gave three and a half years ago or so, I tried to assign the probability to this. Mm -hmm. And I did some whatever random numbers and so on. And now I actually think that I shouldn't because I don't know. Simply, I completely don't know. And we know, and I know that I think that Jan on, on the chat, he wrote that it's now non-zero. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I guess that, that that's the, probably the best, the best way to put it. It's non-zero because, and I think it's actually, uh, but it's not necessarily as small, but it doesn't imply that this number is small. Yes, it doesn't automatically it, it, it imply that this number is small. I would make that modification to his statement. Uh, why? I actually think, and this is my personal, again, I would say belief, that biochemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid is possible. So that life can use sulfuric acid as a solvent instead of water to create some complex organic chemistry that undergoes Darwinian evolution that we could call colloquially life. Yes, of course, this is going to be life that is going to be unlike any life here that we have on Earth. And we have to state it very clearly because there were gazillions of papers on this topic that Venus is uninhabitable because Earth life cannot exist in the clouds of Venus. And I would say that, I mean, it is, it is, it is obvious, yes? I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even mad. It is not even, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it, 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 it's obvious, yes? Our life cannot exist in the clouds of Venus. So writing an entire paper about the fact that our life cannot exist in the clouds of Venus, well, it's, while it's perfectly correct, it's maybe a little bit not, I mean, it's not that important because obviously if life exists there, it's going to be very different. So, uh, but a different biochemistry entirely. So that's probably a rather tangential and lengthy, lengthy answer to the question. But please more, more, yes. Any questions? Uh, uh, let me also ask about the absorber layer, which I found very yeah. fascinating because I also heard that not only it changed throughout throughout the regions and time, but it's 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 known it's not detected at the poles, which is also very peculiar. <laughs> if it should be explained in some abiotic way, so yeah. It yeah it is it is predominantly you know in the sort of mid latitude equatorial region and on of course on both hemispheres but this might be a simple explanation or a complex explanation and it depends because it fits both non biological and biological explanation at the same time for the absorber mm -hmm. the polar regions the way the atmosphere circulates in the on venus makes the polar region extremely chaotic in terms of the you sort of, let's say colloquially, you know, the, the, the air movement there is going to be quite chaotic. Mm -hmm. And that we, one could speculate that the reason why there is not so much absorber there or, uh, or, or um, is because the, the air movement there makes it somehow difficult to detect it it's it makes it a little bit i don't know something like that for example there is also an open question and i'm not an i i cannot answer that now because i just don't know, don't remember enough information on this it might be that it's also more difficult to observe the poles when it comes to observation of absorber so the lack of absorber there and i don't know if this is true because i just i just forgot how where the absorber was really well, how well it was observed in what region so, so i so if if uh, so, somebody can me, can correct me in the chat later on. Um, but the point is that there is also the question: of, is the is the observation of the absorber equally efficient in the polar region as it is somewhere else? Um, that has to be answered. But I think that we can easily explain, or at least find a reasonable explanation, why it is not in polar regions, why it is somewhere else, on the grounds of different atmospheric movements in these two regions. Yes, and uh, I, and 
Yes, exactly. And, and, and actually, I, was, I wanted to avoid using a highly scientific language, but I see that, yeah, that Jan Spacek is not afraid of that. And he says, hardly says, could explain it if the absorbent is brought up from the lower clouds. And that's exactly what I was trying to actually say <laughs> without using the term hardly. So now you officially know what I mean. So, so, uh, so, basically, um, so basically, that could be. But otherwise, I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, but it doesn't mean, but we know that, you know, if we if we were to be alive and we wanted the most stable conditions in the clouds, we would want to live in the mid latitude and equatorial regions, not in the polar poles because of the hardly sailed circulations and all of that. And that could be also the reason why the absorber is not there if it is biological because the poles are less habitable, less stable, for the for the uh, aerial biosphere, mm -hmm. hypothetical, I will add, because then it will be put out of context somewhere in in some clipped video later on. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Uh, we, we cannot hear you, Mirka. Now you can hear me. Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, I have a, a question, which uh, is also a probability question, uh, because uh, if uh, we find that the probability of uh, life on Venus is uh, close to 100% in the future, it will uh, mean that uh, life is quite common in the universe, or will it will have crazy consequences, I think. Uh, are you afraid of consequences like this? And uh, do you consider it like scientifically somehow? Like, okay, if it is on Venus, then there is, it, it is on Neptune and uh, Pluto and uh, Oumuamua and everywhere. <laughs> that's that, that, that's a great, no, this is a fantastic question. Because if we find, yeah, absolutely. Think about this. I know you already thought about this, so it's not that, that I, that, think about this. If life exists in Venus, and it is not based on water as a solvent, but it is some unbelievably peculiar cloud-based organisms that use sulfuric acid as a solvent and have completely ori different origin of life than our own water-based life here on Earth, then it means that life is virtually an inevitability of the existence of the universe itself. And it is unbelievably diverse in terms of its possible chemistry that it can be. Of course, it's all going to be carbon-based. We can have another discussion about that. But the point is that it's going to be unbelievably diverse because not only you can have it in, in conditions that are wildly different than water-based conditions of Earth or Mars or Europa or anything like that, but also this proves that you can have different paths to life's origin, that you are not locked into one critical path that leads to the origin of life, chemical critical path that leads to origin of life, that you can originate life in multiple ways. And eventually when the, evo where the, evolu when the evolution kicks in, it just goes on. And if you can originate life in multiple ways, then there you go you can essentially have life everywhere in many, many different variants. Now, there is a philosophical sort of scientific, but also an unresolved funny question that I would love discussion on this because we don't, don't have an answer to this. Can life undergo solvent replacement? <laughs> and that's the funny question because the answer to that might sound like it's complete stupidity to even postulate that. What do, you, what do I mean by life by, by solvent replacement? Let's say that life as the, in the course of evolution, let's say that the, that the view that Venus was a habitable world in the past, in the sense that it had water, oceans, and seas on the surface of the planet is correct. Then it, Venus lost its, lost its water almost entirely. And the only liquid that is present is concentrated sulfuric acid. Can life adapt its own biochemistry, slowly changing it from water to concentrated sulfuric acid throughout hundreds of millions of years of evolution? There is no such pre precedent on Earth, of course. 
Yes, there is none. But it, are we absolutely sure that life cannot change its own solvent? If if there is enough time, enough evolutionary pressure, and so on, we don't. Know. I have a, I have a just idea. If we, we are now in a position as as humans to create some kind of artificial life that uh, doesn't uh, uh, doesn't depend on water, uh, for example, like uh, micro robots and something like this. And maybe if there were some like uh, intelligent life uh, before on Venus, uh, they were not able to reach uh, uh, like orbit, but they were able to create some artificial life uh, to that will remember them in the in the clouds. Who knows? I was, <laughs> uh, this this actually touches to a, touches a funny funny question. I, it, actually, that's 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 actually quite interesting. But it's, it, it, what what it touches is. If Venus was classically habitable, so with this, let's say that it was with this, with these oceans and rivers and whatever, what, what, it, and it, it might actually be habitable earlier than Earth. Yes, I mean it might have been. The some climate modeling that, of course, is highly dubious, but nevertheless it is there. It suggests that Venus was was actually a uh, pretty mild. In, in its in, throughout uh, throughout its its habitable history with a with a with a constant temperature uh, of thirty still thirty degrees Celsius. So this was a nice you know sort of environment without craziness going on like on Earth when you have an ice ball Earth and then something else you know. So well actually I shouldn't say highly dubious I would say unknown because we don't know if this modeling is actually true. It might be actually true. But this doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. So I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to. I do not want to imply that. But why, why do I? Why do I m mention this? Is that since Venus changed so much, if it was actually habitable in the past, it could have very well developed biosphere. <laughs> like like it could have uh, all this complicated life on the surface and all of these things in the past. And right now, 700 million years after the Great Resurfacing event, when 90, when 80 percent of the entire planet just got wrecked by lava, yes, we would. Are we? Can we actually get some fossils out there? <laughs> I mean, I know that we are entering the possibilities of super crazy uh, concepts, but if are are we actually able to? Would we actually be able to ever detect? Any type of, if we landed and of course drilled or do whatever, detect any kind of fossils in these conditions, under the conditions of volcanic activity over 700 million years, baking the surface in 465 Celsius degrees for eons and so on. I don't know. And, but that's a, maybe we could actually, uh, maybe we could. Uh, I mean, somebody should look look into fossil preservations under superheated conditions for a very long time, because maybe we, you know when we when we actually land on Venus and the and have the technology to survive the surface conditions much better, maybe there is going to be a Venusian paleontology in some way. Uh, who knows? And is the is Venusian life artificial? If it exists, I think that it is probably a, a result of a natural phenomenon. Uh, I know that there is, a, I, 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 and this is actually by accident when science fiction actually exceeds the reality, or or pre, 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 or or it's or it happens earlier than the reality. Uh, I often get this question when I gave give various interviews because when I say life in concentrated sulfuric acid, then everybody is take, thinking alien. <laughs> and, it's, and it's because yeah okay yeah apparently yes apparently the there's highly highly deadly organism or as they say perfect organism <laughs> uh, is actually uses sulfuric acid as a solvent yes or hey, hello uh, well I agree with that well you can in my opinion build a biochemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid and there's of course a question in the lore of alien was it actually an artificial construct of somebody else, yes?
So we are on that subject, I would say that we are very far away from actually building life that is entirely artificial because we can assemble viruses, artificial viruses from, from building blocks, let's say we can do that. We can empty the cell and then put the components of the cell in and the cell starts to work. But we have to be aware that we are just reassembling something that was already functional. Yes. So it's not creating life from scratch. It is just deassembling. It's like going to IKEA, buying the, the thing, the thing, and then assembling the IKEA furniture, biological furniture from from uh, from little components. It's not coming. We we are at an earlier stage. We are at the moment where we try to figure out what Lego blocks we actually need or what Lego blocks we can actually build from. What Lego blocks are useful, what are not useful and so on. And then once we figure that out, there is a huge task ahead of us, how we actually should assemble them. Because if you, if you think about Lego analogy, you can have the right building blocks, but we can, you can build the nonsense from this as well. <laughs> Even if you have the right building blocks. And we are at the yeah, end stage. We try to figure out what Lego blocks we should use. By artificial life, I meant something like uh, computers or, or robots, which are self-replicating uh, or something like this, where you don't, uh, don't uh need uh, like biochemistry and stuff ah yeah yeah <laughs> uh, who knows i don't know uh, look the point is that sulfuric acid um well well it would not work very well with metals okay. yes that's also and um, so if you're if you're if you're tiny robots in the venusian atmosphere hypothetical tiny robots in the venusian atmosphere are actually built from metals and that might be also difficulty you would have to um but there is there are many ways around it but not necessarily analy analytical chemistry because this is one of the problems that we have in our research that we discovered this very unusual chemistry in concentrated sulfuric acid and we have very few techniques chemical techniques that we can actually use to study it mm -hmm. because you cannot actually inject a sulfuric acid sample to your precious analytical <laughs> chemistry equipment in many cases, yes. That's why some we mostly study this through spectroscopic methods, for example, nuclear magnetic resonance. That is sort of, you know, you do not have to inject it directly directly into the machine, but rather mm -hmm. study this so-called rather remotely. But that's the that's the problem. You can ask yourself hypothetically, let's say that because there is also an open question: are, is sulfuric acid is it possible for sulfuric acid to 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 form pools or reservoirs on the surface of the planet. And I think that it actually is. So in principle, you can have an exoplanet where you have the sulfuric acid liquid instead of water, not in the same abundance, of course, but in some abundance on the surface, forming an ecosystem or at least environment that is similar to air, not from the chemical point of view, but from the ecological point of view, to a degree. And now the question is, if you had an, uh, if you had, uh, an so hypothetical intelligent life, how, uh, <laughs> how, would you, how would you work in that conditions? If you, for example, if, if a lot of your technology would be very, very vulnerable to your own environment. But I think, you, but I think that such hypothetical beings could find a way around that as well. Um, yeah, as long as they can figure out, as long as they have oxygen in their atmosphere and can figure out fire, then then it should be fine. Okay, thank you. No, no question from the chat. <laughs> okay, so let's end again. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, it was. Great. I hope you will accept invitation in the future, especially after the no doubt successful mission of Rocket Lab. <laughs> you can oh, go. thank you very much. I, I mean, I, I, you can count me in. I mean, it, it was great to talk to you. Fantastic questions, and I, I, um, I, I mean, it is it is really a pleasure.
I mean, I, I'm, I'm currently residing in Warsaw permanently. Really? So it's not that far away. Uh, so, so I mean, well, then why... we, we are not geo we are not entirely geographically incompatible. Yes. Right. Uh, right. So that's also great. You can surely look uh, what yeah. will happen next uh, January and how successful your mission so was. Maybe so maybe you can give us pre-release info <laughs> <laughs> in person or <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Okay. That would be fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, that was yeah. that was really a pleasure, and um, and uh, and uh, yeah, let's be in touch. And if you if you if you would like to hear more from our crazy, uh, uh, unusual, groundbreaking science, then then we are always there. Okay. So, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. See you somewhere else. Tak <laughs> Přiznávám, je to žhavější téma, než jsem si myslel. Už aby tam ta jejich sonda byla.